Good morning and welcome to Empowering Older Adults, Strengthening Independent Living with Resources and Support. This program is supported by a grant from MetaFund. A bit of housekeeping, today's program is being recorded. For audio and video, all participants are muted and without video to minimize distraction. For chat, we encourage your questions and comments. Submit them at any time throughout the program. Select the chat button at the bottom of your screen and send a message to Q&A. Your questions will be posed during the Q&A session at the end of the program. And for closed captions, select the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen and click enable live transcription. And now at this time, we welcome Michael Pappas, the Executive Director of the San Francisco Interfaith Council. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey. Uh, good morning. I'm Michael Pappas, and on behalf of the San Francisco Interfaith Council and our collaborating partners, I want to welcome you to this fifth in a series of six online training sessions entitled Empowering Adults, Older Adults. Communities of faith are hubs where older adults feel safe, valued, and may escape social isolation. Faith and lay leaders entrusted with their spiritual care are more often than not first responders in instances when the well-being of older adults is at risk. To better equip faith-affiliated caregivers with the necessary insights, skills, and resources to minister to this vulnerable sector, the San Francisco Interfaith Council, in collaboration with the San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services and the Institute on Aging, supported by a grant from the Meta Fund, offers this six-week online training series entitled Empowering Older Adults. This week's training session entitled Ageism and Ableism will be led by Institute on Aging Lead Supervisor of Consultative Services, Ali Chu. The threefold focus of this presentation will be first, to understand different forms of ageism and ableism and their overall ne negative impact on community. Second, to learn practical tools to support healthy, respectful, and sustainable community living. And third, to examine ways to avoid barriers and prevent abuse. Today is a, a very special day. And as we planned this series, we intentionally planned it around World Elder Abuse Awareness Day. Well, that day has come, that day is today. And before our presentation, uh, it gives me great a pleasure and it's a privilege uh, to introduce a special message from California Attorney General Rob Bonta. Hello, I'm Rob Bonta, California Attorney General. Thank you to the San Francisco Interfaith Council, the San Francisco Department of Disability and Aging Services, and the Institute of Aging for inviting me to join you virtually for your Empowering Older Adults training course. Your tireless efforts to raise awareness about elder abuse are critical to creating the lasting, positive impact we need to see in California. During this year's Elder Abuse Awareness Day, I'd like to join you in taking a stand against all forms of elder abuse, neglect, and exploitation. I'm willing to bet that like me, each of you is here because of an older person in your life who you love and admire or maybe because of an elderly relative or friend who is no longer here, but still inspires you to help those who are. Older Californians spent decades of their lives giving back to their families and their communities. They deserve to spend their golden years reaping the rewards of that hard work. Unfortunately, that is not always the case. Every year, millions of elderly Americans experience cruelty and mistreatment, whether we see it or not. Victims of elder abuse are all around us, often suffering in silence. Our parents, grandparents, friends, neighbors, and loved ones. We must do more to change this unacceptable reality. At the California Department of Justice, we're committed to ending elder abuse, supporting survivors, and holding perpetrators accountable. In 2020 and 2021 alone, our Division of Medi-Cal Fraud and Elder Abuse conducted more than 2,700 investigations filed more than 150 criminal cases, and secured 131 criminal convictions. We're prosecuting nursing facilities that prey on our seniors. 
we're standing up to predatory healthcare companies that inflate prescription drug costs. And we're issuing guidance on how to identify and report elder abuse. It's a start, but we have more work ahead. All of us have a role to play. We all need to raise awareness, combat isolation, and strengthen protections that prevent these crimes from happening in the first place. Together, we can ensure that California seniors experience their golden years in peace and joy. I look forward to our continued partnership in this fight. Enjoy the rest of your training, and thank you again for your work. The success of this training series um, uh, in large part can be credited to uh, today's guest speaker, Ali Chu, lead supervisor of consultative services at the Institute on Aging. Uh, Ali has been a key member of the planning committee and has helped us uh, to secure subject matter experts and to develop the curriculum for this uh, training session. Uh, today, she's gonna be our uh, guest presenter along with Glenn Fishman from the Institute on Aging and so without further ado, I turn the, the floor over to you, two wonderful people. Thank you so much, uh, Michael, and thank you, Trey, for uh, your uh, support and assistance. My name is Ali Chu. I go by she, her, hers. I am with Institute on Aging. And, you know, it's been an honor to be working on this uh, training series with you all. Um, nobody can do this by themselves, right? It takes a village um, to do the work we do. So just wanted to say thank you so much. And uh, Glenn, do you want to say a few words? Introduce yourself real quick. Uh, thank you, Ali. Hi, I'm Glenn Fishman. Uh, work with Ali as a program development specialist. Um, and I was uh, the first presenter in this series. Um, and it was a great experience. So thank you, Michael, and your team. Thank you, Glenn. Great. So, um, just wanted to let everyone know um, I am visually impaired, so I am not going to have my uh, video on. Um, I'll, I'll turn it on after we finish the presentation, uh, so when we do the Q&A, uh, because I'm using assistive technology, uh, listening into, um, you know, two different uh, technologies so I can listen to my um, information what I'm presenting. So if there's ever a pause, that means I'm listening and I'm presenting at the same time. So just give me a, a, a half a second uh, when I'm presenting. Um, so uh, Michael already uh, talked about and, 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 and described the presentation disc uh, description objective. And that's the second slide. Um, I'm not able to see the slide. So I'm just gonna you know confirm with you, Trey, um, from time to time, that's okay with you. Um, so looking at all this objective, I hope that you are in the right room. You didn't come to this training uh, to learn how to drive or uh, um, um, do other stuff. So this is the, the, the training objective we have for today. And really, you know, my whole goal for this presentation is really for us to kind of learn way to support older adults and adults with disabilities. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into uh, more detail in just a little bit. So I would love it if, uh, Trey, we can start the first polling question. So I wanted to put this question out there for you all. Have you ever heard of the phrase such as ageism and ableism? So all you have to do is click yes or no. All right. Um, so hopefully people have a chance to um, do the answer. Um, Trey, would you be able to read the answer out loud for us? Yes. Good morning, everyone. So the question was, have you heard terms such as ageism and or ableism? And we have 46 yes responses, which is 74%, 75% of the attendees and 16 no responses, 25% of attendees. Got you, got you. Thank you so much, everyone, for participating in that polling question. And uh, while you're listening, I encourage you to get your morning beverage going. And, and, um, and, and we really, really love it if you could, you know, help participate and just, you know, kind of check us out, um, put your questions in, like Tracy. And uh, yeah, just, you know, um, 
let us know uh, what you think. And if you have any questions, we'll be ready for you at the end of the presentation. So let's go to slide four. Let's look at the definition of ageism. Um, and, and Excuse me, Emily, yeah. for those yes. of you uh, for whom the poll is still up there, we would ask you manually to hit the little red button to make it go away. Okay, how do I do? No, we, we, we ask the attendees to do that. Thank oh, okay. okay. Proceed. Hmm. Okay, sorry about that. Yeah. So let's look at the screen where it says the definition of ageism. You know, um, a lot of time when we are talking about the word ageism, you know, when, when there's a word ending ism, right? We kind of wanted to think about, you know, where that come from. Right, you know, we 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 hear the word uh, uh, racism, sexism, and all this this different oppression, right? So ageism is a very similar um, concept. It is mostly because people are discriminated against based on their age, and a lot of people think that this only affect older adults. It actually affect younger adults and children as well. Um, people, you know, gauge someone, judge someone based on their age for their productivity, believability and their you know, ability to make decisions because of their age. This is a form of ageism. You know, and I'm sure that, uh, and I've given this presentation uh, quite a few times, and when we do it in person, usually you know, I ask people to share a story about, have you ever experienced you know, um, ageism in your life? And, and people, um, and feel free to put it in the chat if you'd like to write a couple of sentences of you know, your experience, and you know, we're, we're happy to read it at the end. Uh, you know, I'm sure that we all have, right? This person is too old to make decisions. This person is too young to know anything better. You know, well, you know, she's 90. Why should we believe her? She's probably not blah, 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 right? So, so those are things that we, we are kind of, we're talking about here is, you know, we're, we're basing our assumption because of people's age, okay? Um, Let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about ableism. And, you know, and, and I'm reading right now, but we'll, we'll get into more interactive in just a moment. Um, ableism, right? It's very, very similar concepts. You know, um, discrimination based on someone's ability, right? Um, you know, a lot of time we, we see someone with a disability. And, and before this training start, I was having a quick chat with Michael. And we were talking about, you know, a lot of time we look at someone with disability. That's the only thing we see. That's the only identi identity we have, right? Um, I use a um, <clears throat> mobility cane and I on the bus and people always, that's the only thing they see. Hey, lady, hey, blind lady, you know, come and sit down, right? But nobody knows I'm also a mother. I also a, a, a social worker person at Institute on Aging and I'm also an activist. And I'm also a volunteer on the friendship line, right? So, so people don't see the multiple identity we have. We only see this person as someone we see, um, you know, outside, right? And let's also talk about people with um, disability that you really can't see from outside. People with um, intellectual disability, people with mental health disability, right? So, so we have all this kind of judgment, you know, and really based on, uh, again, you know, looking at... Um, the uh, 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 um, productivity and, and what they can or can contribute to the society. And that's a lot of it is really based on the capitalism uh, belief in our society, right? If you can't produce, if you can't work, oh, well, you know, those are people just sit around and, and collect, you know, benefit. And, and, and that's really, really cruel how people with disability are judged. Um, people who are older are judged. And I just really want to credit um, the person who come up with this working definition, uh, uh, Talia T.L. Lewis. Uh, this is a working definition that, that we have adopted um, in this presentation um, with uh, people of color and other community have put together in 2021. So I really want to just credit that. Um, let's go to the next slide. And I want to give um, some example of what we see as ageism, ableism, ableism in the in our society. Um, so I'm gonna ask Glenn, would you be able to read this uh, slide for us real quick? Sure, Ali. Um, 
job announcement, job title, full-time on-site service coordinator, status non-union. Description, the on-site service coordinator will carry out tasks relating to data operation, administration, event and calendar coordination, and in-house donation support. This is a fast-paced work environment where she, he would need to be youthful and physically fit and be fluent with the MS office suite and donor perfect system. Must speak clear English and professional customer service skills highly desired. Must be able to sit at a desk for a long time. California driver's license and clean driving record required. Thank you so much, Glenn. And I think that you're reading the uh, following slide. Um, yeah. So we'll come back to the other slide um, in a second. So yeah, you know, look at the job description, right? You know, and I, you know, again, if we do this in person, I would, you know, ask people, what's wrong with this job description? We see that all the time. You know, you, you go on Craigslist, you go on Indeed and all this job site, you know. What is wrong with this job description that Ali has issue with, right? Where is the ageism and ableism in this, right? So we're asking people to be useful. That's a bit ridiculous, don't you think? Um, and all this tech stuff. Yes, we do need to have all this technology skill, but I think the language could be a little bit more sensitive, right? And, and I'm also looking at California driver's license require. Well, this is not a driving uh, this is not a position that requires someone to drive. It is convenient for folks to write something like that because, you know, uh, we as service provider, we can require people to um, have a clean driver's license, uh, a re-record and driver's license, right? But it's not required. But why is it required here? So this is actually my, my own experience where, you know, I had been a trained social worker for years, 20 some years. And a lot of time when I was applying for job, you know, I see that and I'm thinking to myself, well, that means I can't apply because I can't see and I can't drive. Um, but a lot of the position is in-house. You know, I've been working in uh, different domestic violence shelter, working on crisis line, uh, a counseling and, and supporting staff. And I never had to worry about things like that. So I wanted to urge us when we put out job description, we need to think about, you know, um, what we are putting up as barriers for older adult and adult with disabilities. Um, so, Glenn, do you see the slide um, about Cindy? Would you be able to read that slide? Um, yeah, I'm not seeing it. Um, it should have been before the job announcement, I thought. Right, right. There we go. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah thank you. And could you read that one for us? Sure. Thank Cindy you. is a volunteer tasked to put together a group activity for a senior center. She thought through ways that impact her participants the least physically and therefore prevent injury. She decided everyone should be sitting and a collage would be the perfect brainless activity where she would pre-cut all the shapes and pictures for her participants. She would not bring any sharp objects so no one would get hurt and only one kind of glue would do the job. She also thinks no music is best because then she wouldn't have to worry about the types of music. And she assumes most of her participants can't hear much anyway. Wow. So again, um, this is this looking at this post, you know, and, and I would really post out there for you all to think about what's wrong with this picture. You know, at the beginning of the discussion, it sounds like Cindy is very concerning, right? She want to make sure her participants are safe. She thinks through all this stuff. At the same time, her assumption of older adult participating, well, they can't do this, they can't get hurt, they can't this and that, right? You know, and 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 it's very ages, you know, the way she approached it, right? And and okay, well, maybe they can't hear, so I'm not gonna worry about music, you know. So, so again, this is just one example for us to really think about, wow, when we are planning a program when we're making plan, who is it for? Is it for me that's making it more convenient for me? Or is it for the participant where they can fully enjoy the activities? So those are just two quick, you know, um, examples for us to really think about, you know, ageism and ableism are everywhere in the, um, in our society. Okay, so let's go to the next slide where we talk about language. Um, yeah. So when we are thinking about language and, and, and language plays into 
a lot what we're talking about today um, regarding to ageism and ableism is when we speak, we want to really make sure we understand, you know, our privilege when we speak, right? Word matters. We Word has a lot of powers. You know, when I say something, um, it means, it, it, you know, it, it it's, may not touch anything, but it could really hurt someone. You know, uh, when I was working in uh, one of the domestic violence shelters, um, you know, one of the clients told me that she and she was somebody, someone with, with a disability. And she said, you know, she was never, never physically abused by her abuser. But the, the verbal abuse really cut deep in her uh, inside. And that really just touched me. I go, wow, that, that's really, really powerful. You know, someone could say something could really, really, um, you know, it really gets deep. So I just really want us to really think about when we speak, and I'm talking about daily speaking. So you here you see, um, you know, what I say here is not using words that um, uh, or, or phrases that would uh, continue perpetuate uh, oppressions. So here are some example in the same slide. You know, uh, we see this um, uh, these these words and phrases all the time. So we wanted to really encourage people not to use dumb, lame, insane, crazy. You know, it, it, it doesn't describe, you know, um, something that's stupid. You know, we hear that all the time and it just, it is very hard for me to stomach. You know, sometimes people say, oh my God, that movie is so dumb, you know, and, and, and you know, I want us to really think about the root, um, you know, when we are speaking on words, you know, um, you know, historically the word dumb, you know, in a medical uh, term, that means people who can't talk. And so, you know, um, the word lame, that means people who don't walk uh, really well, right? Um, um, who have a, a um, issue and mobility issue with their, um, with their walking, right? So when we use this word to describe unintelligent, even though we're not talking about people with disability, you know, we are in other way, you know, putting down people with disability, if that makes any sense. Um, and one example I always give um, when I give training in a, a domestic violence shelter setting is that, you know, for ancient time, we, we say the rule of thumb is, um, uh, you know, blah, 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 right? And, and somebody say, hey, wait a minute, what does that phrase mean, right? And so the rule of thumb, you know, is that in the old times, it was okay to hit your wife with a stick as thick as your thumb, like, like, you know, and that, that's legal. So to understand the root of that phrase, you know, we would not want to, we would not want to use that phrase, right? So same goes here. You know, we, we constantly, constantly see, um, um, you know, media article and using those words to describe, you know, what's going on in the world. And that's really not okay. That's really not okay. Um, I keep hearing phrases, people say, well, I'm having a senior moment you know, when we are forgetting things, um, that's, that's really not okay. You know, a lot of seniors um, um, can remember more than we can remember, right? Um, we really wanted to avoid phrases like that, you know, um, using the word paralyzed to describe how uh, we are, uh, uh, how we feel. I'm feeling stuck. You can use it, you can say you're feeling stuck. You don't have to feel like, uh, you don't have to say that I, I'm, you know, I'm paralyzed by my fear or I'm crippled by this and that. You know, these are really, really negative terms that um, people with disability and older adult would not uh, want us to use. It's not respectful. Um, you know, wheelchair bound. Oh my goodness, I cannot. Um, and, and Glenn had heard me correct people all the time in our meetings. You know, we really don't want to use uh, the term wheelchair bound because again, wheelchair are tools. They are tools for people to move around. They're not bound in the wheelchair. They're not tied up, you know. It's a tool for us. So we really wanted to avoid using those words because it's not respectful. It's not people with disability and older adult like to be described. So this is just something simple. And 
you know, I, I've been often asked, you know, Ali, don't you have something, you know, I mean, come on, something more important going on for you to kind of pick, uh, nick pick on people is what they say, you know, and, and I say, yes, I do. People with disability and older adult are important. That's my mission. That's my work. And, and that's my life, you know. So when we say things that continue to perpetuate that negative and that, that, that those oppression, that's important. And we need to call people out on that. You know, I, I, I will uh, write the New York Times. I will write the, um, the uh, uh, Washington Post when they write things like that. And you can go ahead and Google them. You know, phrases like this, what I point out here, are very, very common in the newspaper. All right, let's go to the next slide. Um, ageism and ableism also uh, continue to show up in our community in different ways, right? Um, and, and it really, really makes our people vulnerable. Um, you know, um, looking, at, looking at all these different data here, you know, we know that, um, you know, a lot of people, older adults, are in the category um, of being abused, right? Um, one out of 10, seniors experience um, uh, um, elder abuse, right? And why is that? Why is that? You know, when we're thinking about that, you know, um, when we talk about ageism and ableism earlier, we think about, well, let's, let's, let's put that, my friend, an assumption there, right? Uh, say that I, um, I take care of someone who's older. And my assumption is, well, you know, nobody, nobody cared about you because you're older, so I can do X, Y, Z to you, right? So the assumption of that, those ableism and ageism really plays into contributing um, uh, the abuse that people um, uh, experience. In the NPR report, found that people with intellectual disability are raped seven times higher compared to those without um, disabilities. That's really, really scary, right? Um, again, because of the age, um, ableism that we have in our society, we don't believe them. We don't believe that. Uh, and that's not even get me start talking about these um, sex education that lacking in this community. You know, people are very put in the vulnerable situation. Um, women with disability are 40 times, uh, 40 percent higher a chance has 40 percent chance higher uh, to be in in intimate uh, um, violence relationship compared to those without disability. So those are data we know. Um, and, and you will get this PowerPoint as a PDF at the end of this presentation. And you can click on those, uh, those things with the underlying thingy. I don't know what you call it. And you can read all this article uh, yourself. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the, the, here are some, you know, uh, example that I put together. And, and again, these are uh, people's name have been changed. Um, so I just wanted to let you know and that the scenario, I had combined them. And these are all live experience um, from 20 some years of my work. So I have collected them and, and presented here. So I want to honor the survivor slash victim. Um, of, of these people. So Glenn, would you be able to read Sam, uh, Sam's story for us? Yes. Thank you. Sam lives at his own home of 60 years with his daughter and son-in-law who are his primary care providers. Sam is diabetic and recently developed some mobility issues. Sam's daughter is not allowing any visitors or communication, claiming Sam is too tired to visit or talk on the phone. Meanwhile, his daughter tells Sam she is concerned about his health and it is best Sam transfer the house to her and her husband before Sam could have any visitors at home. Whenever Sam wants to visit with his brother, his daughter would accompany him, allowing no privacy for Sam and his brother. Thank you, Glenn. Yeah. So people um, might have heard stories similar like this, right? Um, there's a lot of um, there's, there's a lot of abuse, um, um, type of abuse happening here, isolation you know, an impossible financial um, uh, abuse and uh, undue influence, you know, uh, and Glenn and I would probably have seen similar cases in our meetings, you know, um, and this is a base, 
um, ageism, right? Well, you can't do it. I'm worried about you. So I'm going to just take over. Um, and if you have heard a story like this, please put it in the chat. Let us know that you have heard things like that. And, and, and this is not acceptable. Yeah. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, do you want to read Amelia's story for us? Let's give another. Sure. Amelia works from home as a freelance writer. She uses a wheelchair and has a service dog. Her partner of 10 years often restrict ramp access with objects, so Amelia would have to ask for support. Her partner usually will provide task support rather than clear up the path, tasks such as going to the bank and picking up medication. Amelia's partner often would take advantage of those transactions by taking cash and or meds for themselves. Last week, Amelia lost a big contract and her dog was sick. Her partner refused to help take the dog to the vet or pay for the vet bills. Mm. So again, you know, the ageism plays in this scenario where um, because um, all these barriers that, that we as a society slash um, Amelia's partner, right? Um, you know, I can do this to you. I can just, you know, prevent access. So you will do this, you know, and I can control you this way, right? Thank you, Glenn, for reading that. And let's read the last example, uh, Jackson. Sure. Um, Jackson is a retired accountant. He lives by himself and is active online through forums and games. Three weeks ago, he started dating someone from one of the forums. This person said he's a veteran and owns a home in Northern Oregon. He would like to have Jackson sell his home and move in with him. He claimed he can, quote, move things around, unquote, so there will be tax benefits for them both, and made recommendations to join their accounts for investments. Jackson is over the moon about this relationship and tells all his friends he can't wait to move to be with his new partner. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you so much for reading that. And again, I want us to really think about, you know, um, I, I, I really wanted to put it out there that not because people are older, uh, not because people with disability are, you know, uh, they are supposed to be abused. They are vulnerable because us as a society, you know, um, at, you know, for ableism and ageism, put them in the vulnerable places, right? Um, and, and Jackson, who might be isolated, who is an older adult, even though um, he's very um, savvy with technology, you know, he's, it sounds like he's falling into this woman scam situation where it's very dangerous. And we have seen a lot of that. Thank you so much, Glenn, for helping um, to read that. Um, let's go to the next slide. You know, uh, oh, actually, let's do a poll number two. Yes. How can you help, you know, people in all these different situations? How can you help? So here you see um, you have choices. You know, we wanted to see if you can uh, select a choice. And, and uh, Trey, I'll, I'll um, wait for your, um, let me know that when you think that people are ready. Okay, I see people voting. We'll wait for a few more. Second, the question yeah. is, uh, you know, how can you help? The first uh, A is express a commitment to centering those who are most impacted by the system and oppressions. B, examine where you enter. C, explore what you would like to do. D, create collective access. And E, all of the above. And so far, uh, those who voted, everyone says all of the above. Thank you so much, Trey. And thank you so much, everyone, for, for participating. Absolutely. You know, for us to really work, uh, make this work, is really having that collective, really having that, that, that framework of, you know, um, um, client-centered and trauma-informed, you know, who is being affected by ageism and ableism. And as we saw that the previous slide, you know, in the age, uh, ableism slide is you do not have to be disabled to experience um, ableism, right? You do not have to be older adult to experience um, ageism. We are all affected as a community. 
Thank you for participating. And, and usually when we do this training, we do it, you know, for two hours, three hours straight. And this is a concentrated training. So I apologize for moving this slide so fast. And um, anyone who's interested in having more conversation, please, um, at the end, you, you will see my contact information. So next slide, how to be an ally um, um, when providing services. Um, we as a community member, uh, service provider, friends, families, and, and faith leaders, you know, let's look at the list that we can think about. You know, we, number one, we want to really focus on the needs rather than the diagnose. A lot of time, you know, people come to me, they call me, they email me. Well, I have a 75-year-old um, uh, uh, diabetic woman um, uh, uh, who is a wheelchair user. Okay, so the discussion number one is right there, right? 75 year, um, 85 year old, you know, that's the discussion and the diagnosis. You know, we don't hear, and, 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 and that would really encourage us to, after the training, when we are presenting a case, maybe we can say something like, um, well, we have uh, uh, a, a, a senior who um, lives by herself, um, who probably have some needs uh, for in-home care, and these are her um, um, uh, demographic. So presenting the needs rather than the demographic first, um, because again, we focus so much on that and think that that's a contributing factor. Well, I, I like us to really reframe that. You know, the contributing factor might be our assumption, might be the obstacle and barrier that society have put on, right? So I, I would really uh, wanted to invite folks to do that, um, to really think about that. Um, to when we work with people, right? Uh, we want to speak to that person directly rather than their family member, caregiver, or interpreters. Um, this is a really funny story. Um, a lot of time when I get on Muni bus, um, you know, sometimes the um, the person come and check on the ticket, right? I don't know. I'm sure a lot of you have experienced that. And oftentimes, if there's someone sitting next to me, uh, there's a, are you with her? And, and I'm thinking to myself, uh, first of all, I'm right here. Second of all, do I need, can I not be alone? And a lot of time, older adults and people with disability are you know, have that treatment. You know, we are not supposed to be, quote, allowed to be alone. We are supposed to be accompanied, right? So people don't speak to us directly. And that's, this is, this is real. <laughs> this is real. I'm sure uh, uh, Glenn had seen that. Glenn and I, we have traveled together on the airplane, on the bus. So, you know, I'm sure you've seen that and, and, and other older adults as well. So just when people come into our office, um, we really want to make sure we speak to the person directly. Um, and later we'll, we'll, we'll have a sheet about uh, deaf community. Uh, one thing to really understand when we're working with folks who probably need an interpreter, either a language, uh, a, a, a language of different uh, language, Chinese, uh, uh, Spanish, or AHL, we want to speak to the person directly so we know that this is the person I'm talking to, okay? Um, and understanding that they may be... Um, in case there's abuse happening, their family member might not be uh, impartial uh, when they do translation, okay? So we, we wanted to make sure that. Um, explore communication barriers and tools um, if you are using uh, those support and really focus on building that trust rather than interrogating uh, when we are asking questions. You know, have you eaten today? What can I get you? You look really cold. You don't have enough shoes, uh, a, a, a socks or shoes, you know, things like that. When I work at, um, before I work at um, uh, IOA, I used to work at this organization called Senior and Disability Action. Thank you, SDA. And I remember one time I worked with this woman um, and she came in, she had five pairs of socks on her both feet because she didn't have any shoes. Her shoes are stolen. So, I came out because, you know, I would walk to work and I came out with a pair of a nice slipper and say, man, can I give this to you? Because I don't want you to be stepping on needles. And she was very hostile at the beginning when she came into the office. After I gave her that piece, uh, shoes, that pair of shoes, she completely changed her attitude. She was like, Ali, I want to talk to you because we want to build that, that trust. So people would tell us what's happening, right? Um, 
But when we constantly focusing on their age and their disability, people are not going to open up to us. So we wanted to really be aware of the support network and those resources out there, uh, both in San Francisco and outside of San Francisco, to really provide that support for folks. Um, the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. Thank you so much, um, um, Trey. So here are just some information, uh, not just, here are information about uh, communicating with folks um, who uh, English is not their first language. And a couple of things I want to point out, um, um, the deaf community um, may not uh, um, identify themselves as people with disability. Um, it's a little different from older adult who become um, hard of hearing and deaf later on. Um, it's a little different culture, but we really want to respect that. Uh, here are some tools for us to know that when we have ASL interpreters, these are some guidelines, uh, and then really looking at the guideline from the ADA, um, American with Disabilities Act, um, some guidelines that we really wanted to make sure that we follow the law. Um, again, not using family member to translate, for example, um, this very, very important uh, that that interpretation are impartial and accurate. Yeah. Um, one example I can give real quick is that, you know, say that uh, a, a, um, a mother who is deaf, um, who is being experiencing domestic violence from the husband, if the mother is in the hospital in the uh, with her child, minor, you know, sometimes doctors and nurses will ask the child to interpret and what's happening with your mom, what's happening. Do you think the mom will be open to tell the nurses and doctor that the child's father is hitting her? She probably won't, right? So she want to protect her daughter's emotional um, part here. So she would lie and say, no, nothing's happening. I feel down. We see that a lot. So please do not use minor child or any family member uh, when we uh, interpret, yeah? Um, let's see, am I missing anything? Uh, yeah, so let's go to the next slide. I wanted to make sure we have enough time uh, to ask questions. So I'm speeding through. Um, again, you will get this PowerPoint at the end of the presentation. And please, please reach out to us um, if you have any questions and follow up. Yeah, what might be step to take uh, 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 to build that trust? Yeah, look at this uh, slide. Um, you know, I really, really want to make sure that uh, I quote this um, really famous quote from disability activists. Nothing about us without us. Um, a lot of coalition, a lot of uh, support network really, really believe that we have to include the voices of seniors and people with disability when we make policy changes, when we make decisions, uh, and, and we have this leadership uh, uh, um, uh, structure, right? Um, when we have a forum, when we have a, uh, a training or uh, instruction, we have to make sure that who is not in the uh, who who is in the uh, in the room and who is not in the voice. We have to make sure that are we including people who are affected in these matters that we're talking about. You know, um, it's really really important because you know when we look at the history of um, um, ableism, for example, we look at the history of disability rights. You know, we look at the the um, eugenics. We look at the um, ugly law. We look at ways that all um, approaching from the medical model where, well, I know I know more than you do as a doctor. I know more than you do as parents. I know more than you do as a teacher, right? But people with disability, they know their body the best. So they have to know more than everybody else do, right? Older adults, they know their body. They know their mind, right? Uh, and, and so we wanted to respect them and they have to have a voice at the table. So really wanted to... Um, make sure that we have that collective um, um, and support and access and really kind of find ways to incorporate those voices in our decision-making, in our collaborative, um, in our activism, right? Um, here, we wanted to make sure that uh, we, um, we have reason to really uh, make sure that we have a uh, way to provide services in, as, as much as possible with trauma-informed. You know, um, seniors and people with disability have experienced trauma that maybe other people have not, right? Um, and stuff that I talked about my own experience, um, it's, it's not trauma, but there's definitely trauma there in my life, right? 
um, different way that people are experiencing trauma. We wanted to make sure that we're trauma informed. We want to make sure that we provide rapid response to access requests. You know, when people reach out to you and we don't have any um, way to respond to this request, that trust is broken already. Yo, well, nobody get back to me. Nobody let me know that they have interpreters. So I'm not going to reach out. Those barriers we have to break down. Be creative, be inclusive, be culturally sensitive and responsive to all these requests. Um, it's really, really important that we get there. We understand that, hey, we got to get there. We got to do that. Let's go to the next slide. Again, really acknowledging the leadership of people who are older and people who um, have disabilities. You know, put them in the leadership um, in your organization. You know, get them on your board. Get them to volunteer. Get them to be a staff. To be um, to be working with us. So we have everybody's voice um, in the room. All right, I'm speeding through this. Let's look at the resource real quick. I wanted to make sure that. Um, we have all of this stuff that, you know, just touch base a little bit before we go into the Q&A. Um, there's a lot of fun stuff. We're looking at uh, this chair rocks. Uh, it's great uh, literature and, and video we can watch um, and different stories. Um, Stella Young is a really, uh, she she had passed away a few years ago. Um, I want um, you, if, when you have time, please check out Stella Young's uh, TikTok and talk about really not using people with disability as inspiration, right? People look at us, you know, and say, wow, Ali, you're so inspirational. You know, how do you live your life like this? Well, listen, I live my life. <laughs> I'm not here to be your inspiration. So we don't want to objectify people, right? And here I have a, a link for the 504 sitting. That's the protest to get the 504 Rehab Act um, signed in 1977. Um, just a fun fact, um, and a good important fun fact that um, the San Francisco, um, we have this huge protest uh, and we have the biggest protest at the state building um, for people to really make sure that the Fire for um, Rehab Act was signed. And this was a stage um, in 1977. There's a video documenting that. Actually, today, Glenn and I, we are going to the state building right after this to host a press conference, the exact same location. So here are some resources local. Um, please uh, reach out to all these different organizations. If you, if you don't know how to support folks, if you have questions, you know, these are places you can call, you can email, and they can support you with different needs. And again, if you, you know, if they say, oh, we, we can't help you, you know, I really want to encourage folks to say, well, if you can't help me, please tell me who, it, who can help me. Okay. So I hope this is helpful for folks. And I'm here uh, to answer any questions you have. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ali. This was wonderful, comprehensive, informative. Um, and at this point, I'd like to invite Glenn back into the room. Uh, and we have, I just wanted to say also to, to those attendees, this was the best attended of the five sessions thus far. Uh, and a lot of you uh, shared some important resources um, and also uh, experiences that resonated with this particular um, uh, presentation. We, we, do, uh, we do not uh, activate the chat for everyone or the uh, videos because we've been trying to um, minimize distraction, uh, but we will be harvesting this information and sharing it with the um, with the with the presenters. Uh, there was one particular question that I wanted uh, that came from a um, uh, from one of the attendees. Do you have any data on the prevalence of ageism and elder abuse in other countries compared to the U.S.? That is a really good question. That is a really good question, and I think that a lot of time I'm having a hard time turning on my video. I don't know how to do it. Um, I think you're on mute. Let's continue. And, and, and Ali, when, you, when you're able to access, unmute and access, uh, please join oh, us. Oh, I'm so sorry. 
Did am I on mute now? You're good. Yeah. Fine. Great. Okay. I'm so sorry. Welcome back. <laughs> I, I gave a long answer and nobody heard me. <laughs> you can repeat it very quickly. <laughs> yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yeah. So the 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 thing is that a lot of time people we don't collect information because of ages and ableism. So we don't have those information. That's the bottom line. You know, a lot of times we do all this different research and things. And I'm, I'm always, you know, the one calling people, hey, why isn't this data collected? Age and disability. So just really wanted to put it out there. So I apologize. We don't. I don't. And personally, I don't. And maybe people have and please share. Okay. Thank you. I, I have. They say confession is good for the soul. And I have to confess, I was part of the 25% in the first poll uh, who was wrestling with what is ageism versus ableism. Uh, and if I'm correct in, in everything that you said, uh, it's a discrimination because of age and a discrimination because of ability. Is that right? That's correct. And I really want to say that it interchange and, 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 and interchange and, and, and also combine too. So you know, we have, and, and I think that we we talked about it last time um, when uh, Dr. Um, P was talking about isolation, right? And uh, when we were debriefing, I brought up the I, the the the, uh, the picture of people who are older don't want to go out because they don't want to be seen using a wheelchair. They don't want to be seen using a walker, right? So though we can have our inner ageism, ableism in us, right? We don't want to be seen this way and that way because the, the society believe for us that we, have, we are ingrained in those beliefs. Okay, I'd like to drill down on this question because mm -hmm. um, there are different generations, okay? Um, there's the silent generation, also called the great, the greatest generation, the boom, the baby boomers, of which I am at the tail end, um, the Generation X, Millennials, Generation Z, and now Generation Alpha. Um, is this discrimination different in in these different generations towards uh, older adults? I, I, you know, I think that I think that you know people can. I, I'm not sure I understand everything. In, in that my friend, but but I think that to 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 briefly touch on that is like, you know, they are kind of named for different generation, right? The baby boomers of the different generation. But I think that as long as we're not basing oppression based on their age and generation. So let's just say that, well, you know, the baby boomers, they are blah, 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 blah. Then we're kind of kind of like this is this slate, uh, what what do you call it, generalizing, this is what these people do. And there's nothing around it, and, and we can't argue about it. No, we can't do that. So, so as long as we're not doing that, um, does that answer your question? Well, let, let me drill down further. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, I I'm part of a generation that learned how to write checks and uh, and and record their uh, appointments and date books, and and there is a digital divide, mm -hmm. and and there are you know, and and there's an assumption I think by younger generation that everybody should know how to, to do everything electronically and technically. Um, how, how does that impact ageism and ableism in your, in your mind? Absolutely, and, and I, I'm so glad you clarified. And that's exactly why I put that first um, job posting on, is that you know, when, we, when we are hiring people, who are we excluding, right? The, you must be fluent in this and this and this app. So, you know, and you will often hear people um, order a doubt, you know, they can't find job, they can't find job because they don't have this and that and that skills, right? But why should that be the case? Why can't we say, well, you know, if we are willing to learn certain app or willing to be trained or whatever other compromise that we can support folks who can be in our job, uh, a workforce, right? Um, so yeah, definitely, I, I think that, you know, um, different generation have different skills and tech at the same time. Who are we including? Who are we excluding? That's the key. Thank you. Um, I also was very um, kind of grateful that you brought up the issue of driver's license, because I think we weaponize driver's licenses. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, probably two of the most difficult situations I've been in is having to, you know, take the keys from my own mother when she was not able to to drive, um, but also a very dear friend here in the city. And I, and and in 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 responding to her when she couldn't drive anymore, I said, you know, 
I said, in this city, I said, I'm actually quite envious of you because we have ride shares, uh, Uber, Lyft, and Flywheel. I said, honestly, if I didn't need a car in the city, uh, because this is not a friendly city for cars, um, I wouldn't have one. I mean, between parking tickets and maintenance uh, on, on horrible roads and, and the like. But I'm wondering if, if the real issue here and, and the emotional damage that is being done by weaponizing driver's licenses is this issue of the loss of independence and also, you know, bringing up the issues of mortality on the side of, of those whose licenses are, 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 are being weaponized. I was wondering if you could address that. Absolutely. And I think that, yes, like you say, you know, uh, uh, it's really about independent, right? And and I think that, you know, you and I see it differently. I, I'm never able to drive in my whole entire life. And I, I often tell my friends, I, you know, I always dream that I'm driving, right? And I think that it's 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 that independent. You know, for me, I'm very, very comfortable on public transportation. I walk everywhere and I'm a, a um, public transportation advocate, you know, um, SCA and folks in the past, we advocated for free muni for seniors and people with disability, right? So I'm a huge on that. And I think that it's that my friend that if we are taking people's um, driver's license away, you know, there are other ways to kind of approach that and say, hey, you know, they are, uh, if we have, you know, better system, I really hope we do. Um, sorry, Tom, Nolan. <laughs> you know, I really, I really hope that we really spend more energy and time in pushing for better public transportation so we won't feel such isolated when we can't drive. I hope that makes sense, you know. Um, and, 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 and back to the other issue with people with disability and, and having that driverless license requirement on the job posting, it's, it's, it's difficult. And I, I, yeah, I want to invite folks to not do that in their uh, job description. It sounds like a lot of what you're saying is, is, is looking for the alternative to be affirming. That is to say, if, if your driver's license is taken away, is to, to emphasize the other options that are out there uh, in public transportation and ride sharing and the like. Um, uh, so, so as to make everybody feel on a level playing field. I, you know, we interestingly, when uh, when the pandemic hit, uh, one of the observations that that uh, came early on was the fact that um, the playing field was leveled with worship because worship went online, mm -hmm. and so all of a sudden, people who uh, who otherwise uh, could come to worship. We're on the same playing field with people who couldn't come to worship, and now all were able, had access uh, to that worship experience online. Uh, that said, I'm wondering how remote work and living has impacted ageism and ableism. Absolutely. Thank you so much, for Michael, for bringing this up. And I really want to credit Alice Wong, who is a local activist, People with disability have been asking workforce to work from home for decades. I mean, literally decades. And it's because of the COVID situation that other people are affected. Oh, wait a minute, we can work from home. But nobody ever credit people with disability for this thing. For years, we've been asking um, accessibility and accommodation to work from home part-time and things like that. So I really wanted to credit Alice Wong for, for speaking now and talking about this. And yes, absolutely. It really helped. It really provide folks uh, to be able to work from home um, for people with disability and older adults. And also like if we have children, you know, we can accommodate um, the childcare situation, you know, God knows <laughs> it's so expensive to um, put our kids in, in school and childcare and all that stuff, right? It provides that flexibility um, to work from home. And, 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 and it is a privilege to be able to work from home at the same time that we have to understand that that's an accommodation for older adult and adult with disabilities. Thank, thank you very much, Ali and Glenn. Uh, and, and to all of you who, who really uh, offered some wonderful, wonderful comments Again, we will harvest all of these comments and share them not only with today's presenters, uh, but with our planning team, and I'm sure they're going to be of benefit. Um, I also wanted to say a very special thank you to Trey Russell Allen and, and, and Cynthia Zambukas. Uh, we have, uh, along with our online briefings and this training series, 
uh, we have offered our greater community over 100 online virtual experiences since the beginning of the pandemic. It could not have been done without these two wonderful uh, support folk and, uh, and we are grateful for them. We'd also uh, invite you all to join us next Thursday at 8.30 a.m. for the final in our series of six trainings uh, sessions that will focus on the importance of planning and talking about end of life issues. A very sensitive topic, uh, but we look forward to a, a robust conversation and hopefully a beneficial conversation. Thank you once again for your participation. Uh, this concludes today's program. God bless you and God keep you.